Hey, it's Paul Bannis at GreatDad.com, the website for fathers because dads don't always think like moms. And if you're new to the show, Great Dad Talks is a series of weekly conversations with new and expert fathers, all with a point of view on uh, modern parenting. And as I always say, I'm, I, I coach dads all the time, and I'm just it's just fascinating to me the way that the, the role of fathers has evolved over the last 20 years since my, uh, my first was, uh, was born. And uh, I'm always curious as to what you know, what, what things are popping up in all kinds of different domains, hence the reason for the show. If you want to learn more about my coaching for uh, new and experienced dads, you can find me at greatdad.com slash coaching. And today we're is maybe a, we've, I've done, I guess we've done a few shows on, on science, but we're going to get into, uh, into talk a little bit about STEM and where we are in the United States with STEM with Richard Russick, who's the CEO of Art of, Art of Problem Solving, not the Art of Problem Solving, but Art of Problem Solving. So welcome, Richard. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so I'm, you know, we, we hear about STEM and the importance of STEM all the time. And um, maybe talk a little bit about, or maybe put it into, into, into perspective, not just like this amorphous thing, like we got to do more STEM, but why, why is STEM so important? Or where do we rank in the world? Why is it a crisis? Why is it, why is it a threat to our safety? All those things. Yeah, I'll start if you with, can, sum up yeah, the that's, world. That's, that's, a, that's a very big target, but I'll, <laughs> you know, start with the importance. I was uh, about about 20 years ago, I was at a national math competition called Math Counts. And this was the, the program that launched me as a student, um, let's say more than 20 years ago. That was about 35, to 35, 38 years ago. But I was back there 20 years ago as a, as a guest speaker. And I was talking with uh, one of the board members there, and I asked him, I asked him um, why he was involved with Math Counts. Now, Math Counts brings uh, the top four students in each state in middle school to a national competition each year. And it's really, it's kind of the event of the year for middle school math students who are like really into this, this stuff. And they've launched a lot of great math students over the last 35, 40 years. So I was asking him why he got involved. And he said, you know, one of these days, the world's going to fall apart. And these kids are the ones who are going to fix it. And I think there's something to that. I don't want to say it's only the math contest winners that are going to fix everything when it all falls apart. It's clearly true that the world can fall apart. You know, the last 15 months <laughs> have, have given us plenty of examples of what's possible. But like, if you imagine, like, let's imagine uh, the, the aliens came down uh, from, from somewhere and said, all right, we're going to be back in 25 years. We're going to be back in 25 years and we're going to play basketball. You know, they're going to bring some humanoid aliens and we're going to play basketball. And if we humans win, we get to keep our planet. If we lose, they're going to take the planet. Well, you know exactly what we do, right? We'd go find the kids, <laughs> show the most inclination and the most aptitude for basketball. And we would be training them. We'd start when they're about six, seven, eight. We'd start identifying them nine, 10, you know, because 25 years later, eh, they might be ready to, ready to play. Um, we'd start training those kids to deal with the aliens. Now, of course, the aliens are not going to come down and say, hey, let's play some ball. But we do know 25 years from now, there's going to be a serious problem out there that we're going to need really good mathematicians, scientists, computer scientists, and engineers to solve. Don't know for sure what that problem is going to be. We're living through one right now. Right. You know, if you look at the people who came up with the vaccines, and you go back to when they were in middle school, in high school, I'm sure almost every single one of them had a teacher that said, that one right there, she's special. Right. If there's something going on 30 years from now, you want her in the room working on this problem. And that's the same way, that's the same way for like the next generation, whether that problem is going to be finding clean and cheap energy, whether it's going to be another pandemic, whether it's going to be feeding the world, whether it's going to be dealing with you know, various medical issues that come up. Um, we know who to bet on for who is going to be solving those problems in 30 or 40 years. It's going to be those students who have a trajectory that's going to lead them into being at the cutting edge of math, of science, of computer science, of all of these, these sorts of fields. They're going to have an outsized impact on the world going forward. And this is why STEM is so important. And, and where do, where, where is the, we hear that the U.S. has fallen, but where do we rank versus other other countries? This is a really hard question to answer. Okay. Now, if you look at the various international studies, uh, the TIMS and, and all these sorts of things, they make for much better headlines than they do for analysis. Uh, um, because th those tests, it's not always clear who's taking the test or what their incentives right. are. 
uh, that either the test takers or the test um, right. that, that the people who are delivering the tests, they're also not necessarily measuring the right thing. Like if you're talking about uh, building the future scientists and mathematicians uh, and engineers of the world, you don't want to test everybody because it's not everybody that's going to do that. When you're testing mm -hmm. everybody, you're testing literacy. And literacy is super important. I don't want to say that's not important, um, but like there are really two goals in education. Uh, one is broad literacy, and that is getting uh, ideally everybody in your society to have a broad understanding of a few key areas, basic mathematics, reading, writing, um, basic understanding of history, of science, of economics, and how to work with computers. Like that, that maybe there are a few other things that you want to have a, a basic literacy for. Once you've got that, you're good. Um, for that's the literacy, and that's that's what the entire American system is designed for. The public system is designed to promote literacy. Very important goal, very laudable goal. We want that. There's a second important part of of education, and this is probably something that's very important to a lot of your your fathers is mastery, and that is uh, going very deep into something, right. very getting to really mastery level in some topic don't care what it is um, but that it's it, we need masters because those are going to be the professionals later and we need people who have the ability to become masters at something else later and we understand this in a lot of areas in education we understand this in athletics right we, we don't take we don't sit there and say oh pe is going to be good enough for all our best athletes no we right. take the best ball players and we put them on a team we end the school day an hour early and they get to go off with a specialized coach and and learn how to learn how to play ball or learn how to do whatever it is. We understand it with our musicians. We don't do it with our academic students in the schools, but we do it outside the schools. And this is why when you say, how do we compare the United States to other countries? There's another really interesting fact is for the last six years, the United States has won the International Math Olympiad. Mm. We didn't win the prior 20 years. What happened? Why, why have we had so much success recently? A few things have happened. Um, one, is, uh, one is just the set of students. We, have, uh, we, we had, if you look back into say the 90s and 80s, you had a large amount of immigration of people who came into this country because they were excellent at math, excellent at engineering, excellent right. at science. Well, like they Silicon had, Valley and Silicon Valley. Yes, exactly. And those people had children. <laughs> those people had children, they had right. a culture in their homes they had a culture in their homes that was this area of study is what enabled me to have a better life. And they brought that, they instilled that culture in their kids. And so their kids, you know, they really internalized that. Um, also, in, in addition to this, you also had a lot of private resources available that came available in the internet era. Obviously my company is one of them, Art of Problem Solving. I don't wanna say we're responsible for all of this, but we started in 2003. This group of students who won for the last six IMO uh, International Math Olympiads collectively, it's about 20 students collectively. They took about 150 or 200 courses with us. Hmm. They're the first generation of kids to have access to our whole curriculum. They're the first generation of kids to have access to a whole set of summer camps that other people run. I don't wanna take all the credit for this but they have access to a lot of private resources. Um, so this is a part of the American system as a whole that's really, really brilliant, is there are a lot of different avenues now for kids to reach their education if they have access to those avenues. And that's the piece that the United States is missing now. These kids, this set of kids, are they have great trajectories. Sometimes they go to specialized schools. Sometimes they have really special teachers. Often they have parents who are out there looking out for them and finding these opportunities for them but there's a much larger portion of students who don't ever know about these opportunities, who don't ever have them, don't have access, wouldn't even know to look for them. And that's where the American education system's really failing on the mastery dimension. Well, you, is, go ahead. Well, you, you, you really raise an important distinction, I think, here between what we often hear as, as parents or just people watching watching the news is like the, the difference between the importance of STEM versus the importance of an increased level of STEM for every single kid. And um, I guess that's where I've always had a problem where like, okay, let's all do STEM and let's let, like your, to your analogy, like er, let's make everybody NBA worthy, you know, in STEM where that, that isn't really realistic. Is, is, there, is there a distinction to be made there between do we need to raise the STEM level 
uh, the STEM learning level for everyone? Or is your feeling more like, no, we have to identify the real, the, you know, the future brilliant people of tomorrow and make sure they get the resources? Oh, I think we need to do both. So I think you need that basic literacy for mathematics to be, to be higher, basic understanding okay. statistics would be really nice um, because it's, uh, people who are very numerate are, are hard, well, I was going to say they're harder to trip, trick with statistics, um, <laughs> but I'd say the last year or two watching political discourse, I don't think that's true anymore. Um, you know, the, the, the more sophisticated people are, the more sophisticated they are in fooling themselves at times, so they have to be careful. So I, I don't think I can claim that so much, but I think mathematically sophisticated people, you're going to be you're going to be a little bit more likely to be able to convince them uh, if you can actually really bring bring the rigorous mathematical argument because I think it might have been Gauss who, who made the comment that math is very unlike the legal profession in, in legal in in law two half proofs make a proof in math two half proofs you still don't have anything <laughs> and, and you know, I think there is some of that mindset that you'll have with the, the kind of scientific worldview of of constantly questioning, do you actually have the right model of the world? And this is a very scientific worldview, even more than a mathematical one of, okay, I've got a model of how the world works, but I'm constantly looking for things that disprove it. Right. And when I see things that don't fit my model, uh, they trouble me. In, instead of I want to ignore it, I want to forget about it, I want, to, I want it to go away, or I just don't even see it. I think it's a very scientific worldview to have this kind of constantly trying to adjust your priors based on based on new information. Yeah, I, 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 that seems to be something that's lost recently in terms of yeah. the idea that science can evolve and not be continuously wrong. Everybody loves the, the examples where, oh, the scientists got it wrong 200 years ago. They're probably wrong again today. And the scientists would all say, yeah, we're yeah. constantly learning. Every time we get a new data point, we're not so stupid that we say, no, we're going to cling to the old. We yeah. We, we evolve. So that, I guess that brings, goes to the next point I wanted to talk about, which is the, the value of, of science um, and, and STEM learning, math included, uh, for the, the development and the maintenance of objective reasoning in this country. Because we see, we, we talked a little bit before the thing, obviously we've seen it through the pandemic where people just don't even want to, they don't even want to consider the science. But then there, there are people also on the, on the left who use you, you don't necessarily use science for whatever their pet class is as well. But talk about that, about how, how dangerous that is in, in civil society when, when you, don't, you don't understand science and math enough to be able to evaluate these different arguments critically. Yeah, I mean, it might even go outside, uh, say, a scientific worldview, because, you know, like the, if, if we were to actually understand the science, how many people actually understand the science of how the vaccines work? Sure. Um, I'm not so sure I understand all the details and I've read some of the, you know, some of the stuff around it. I'm like, I kind of get how it works. So you don't have to understand how all of the details work. You do have to trust the process. And I think part of, again, a, a big part of the process when it's working well, and I want to be clear, it doesn't always work well because there are definitely, there are politics and science as well. Um, but when it's when it's working well, is there's uh, there there's a feedback mechanism that's supposed to be open to new inputs, and say, oh, this is new evidence. Now it often takes a while for that evidence to win the day. Uh, you know, there, there's a saying that science proceeds one generation at a time, um, which is you know <laughs> a pretty uh, a pretty harsh indictment, but maybe somewhat true that if, if there's a certain worldview of the way we're viewing the scientific world, it's when those people are moved off the stage and the next group gets to come along and say, okay, I've got all this evidence and I don't have to convince all of these people who have a whole career built on thinking of it as a different way. But, you know, worldviews can shift very quickly. Einstein was an example of this. You know, his, his worldview came in and, you know, it took a little while, wasn't accepted right away, but there were, started to be your experimental evidence supporting relativity. And then some of it became incontrovertible and you're just like, okay, we're all going this way now, we're going a different direction. So, um, and, and that is very much kind of the, the scientific worldview. And I'd, I'd say uh, an important thing here is being willing to adjust your priors. And that's one, if I were to say one, one dimension along which I've changed a lot over the last 20 years, it's, it's that my beliefs are much uh, more weakly held than when I was younger. And that just because I have a lot more information now and I'm just like, well, this might not be true. I'm not so sure. 
Uh, you look at all the, say, social sciences. The social sciences, to me, are in complete disarray. You know, the number of those sort of uh, research projects and the, the, the research that does not replicate is really, um, if I were in that field, would be absolutely horrifying to me. I'd be like, oh, I don't know if we actually know anything. And then when people take very narrow bits of information and extrapolate it way beyond wh what it was supposed to cover, like that's also really dangerous and really bad for science. Like it's bad for science when people do that because it ends up being an indictment of scientists when that's not at all what the scientist was trying to say. They were trying to say a very narrow thing and people right. have expanded it. You know, when they do a study of, you know, 17 students in an Ivy League psych department and then they say, this explains, somebody says, oh, this explains the whole world. No, it doesn't. It explains those 17 kids and people, maybe people that look just like them. And most people don't look like that. Um, so I think that's another, another space where we, we have to be careful. So, so I, I mean, get, taking that as a, as, a, as given that the, there is this importance, what about, so what about how, how we teach our, our kids? Let's bring it back down to what our audience yeah. is really interested in. Yeah, so one thing I, I didn't get, a, I didn't address so much in when you asked an earlier question about the importance of, of aiming, raising everybody versus mm -hmm. identifying the stars. Um, the identify the stars piece, I think we have to at least, we have to give every kid the opportunity to discover it for them, to right. discover and be discovered, and then to identify as a future scientist, a future engineer, a future poet, a future whatever it is. But like one of the goals in education is to expose kids to a lot of different areas so that they can find the area that they wanna really go deep in. And this I think is one of the critical things we have to change in the STEM education is this sort of discovery step. And it has to happen young. Like it has to happen you know, in elementary schools where we lose most of our future scientists. We lose them in elementary school by boring them to tears with, a, with arithmetic. And this is the, the big thing I would change in elementary school is not to make mathematics just about arithmetic. And I, I focus on math partly because it's what we do, but partly because uh, that's the stepping stone into uh, often the, into the sciences, into computer science, into all of these other areas. It's where kids encounter this world first is, is in math. Um, but in so many elementary school classrooms, math is just taught as here are a bunch of recipes that you have to memorize and follow and get right every time. Wow, that's boring. You know, like nobody wants to, do, well, I guess there are a few people, but most <laughs> people want to do that all the time. And it's also, uh, it's also not a great strategy anymore. A hundred years ago, it might work, right? A hundred years ago, yeah. if you could get these recipes down, do it right every time, you were gonna be, you were gonna be employable. You were gonna have a job. And in that job, you were gonna be called a computer. Right literally called a computer. And now our computers, they look like this machine I have right here. And they're a lot faster. They're a lot cheaper. They're a lot more accurate. You can replace them. You don't have to buy them healthcare. Like it's great. People are going to prefer the computers to do all of these kind of repetitive tasks. So this approach we're taking in elementary school, not only is it really boring, it's preparing them for a future that doesn't exist anymore. Because anytime we're training a kid to compete with a computer, we're setting them up for failure. Instead, we have to train them for human problems. The, the dealing with the confusing space, seeing something new and saying, where do I start? Like, these are still the human problems. This is what I mean by problem solving is solving problems you've never seen before. Right. And kids are great at that. Kids are natural problem solvers and we train it out of them. You take a four-year-old and you, you got all your dads out there. You know this, right? You, your four-year-old deep down inside may bother you sometimes that that four-year-old is a little bit tougher than you are. And it might be surprising to hear because, you know, your four-year-old, your four-year-old cries quickly. Your four-year-old throws tantrums, gets upset, but you watch your four-year-old. Your four-year-old sees all these things going on in the world. People doing amazing things. They're, they're shooting a basketball. They're cutting vegetables. They're riding a bike and they want to do it too. Yeah. They can't because they're four, uh, but they're going to try. They're going to try and they're going to fail because, you know, they're four. Yeah. And when they fail, they're going to cry and they're going to pitch a fit and they're going to run away. They're going to quit, but then they're going to do something amazing. And it's usually going to be pretty quick. Five minutes later, 10 minutes later, they're going to come back and they're going to try again because they're only four and they haven't learned yet how to quit for good. And somewhere between four and 18, we train this resilience out of kids. We train this toughness out of them and we teach them in our math classes 
that the goal is to be able to do everything right instead of teaching them to to retain that sort of resilience, to keep going out there and looking for hard and interesting things to do and going after them, even if they can't do it right the first time or the second time or the third time. Maybe the fourth time you'll get it and by the fifth you finally will. And this is something we understand in many other areas, right? You understand that when you're teaching, when you're teaching your daughter how to hit a softball. You know, you understand it when you're teaching your, your, your son to kind of work on the car. This is what my dad did a lot with me. Like, I know how to remove an oil filter from a 1988 Mercury Lynx. That'll serve you well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know exactly where I'm going to bust my knuckles. But you know, like there's a certain there's a certain uh, resilience that's reinforced by okay, there it is. Go figure it out. And that's what we need to bring into our math classes is novel, interesting problems, where the first step for the student is figuring out what I should do rather than add these two numbers where you're told what you're so, supposed to. Like, and now I'm really, I'm very curious as to what, what that means. You think it's just a really, they've not found the right kind of a writers to come up with, uh, with the old fashioned story problems that will be enticing to kids. <laughs> I mean, it, yes. word problems are certainly part of it. And then also structures. So in, in our Beast Academy, our elementary school curriculum, we use puzzles. We have on staff here, uh, two members of the US puzzle team one of whom was actually the world champion one year. And as good as these two people are at solving puzzles, they're even better at writing them. So we create these puzzles that uh, in order to get through the puzzle, the student will have to get the reps in. They will have to do their practice because you do have to practice. I don't want to say we never want to teach them how to add, uh, add two numbers. They've got to get the reps in. They've got to master the basics. That's true no matter what they're going to end up doing. But we hide that practice in these puzzles. You got a puzzle, you got a, you know, some rules to, mm -hmm. that the puzzle works under and somewhere in there, they're going to have to add some numbers here and there. The trick is they're going to have to figure out which numbers to add. They're going to have to stare at this puzzle and be like, all right, what thing, there's like 15 things I can do, which one should I try to do first? And then when they get one step, when they figure out, oh, I add these two numbers, I get this number, and then they have to think, oh, now what do I do? What do I do with this? And this kind of higher order, this kind of second level or deeper thinking skill, this is the critical thing we're teaching kids, not the math, not the arithmetic. Like that stuff, again, important, but not nearly as important as these problem solving skills because these problem solving skills, that first step, where do I start? What do I do with this new thing I've just found? What am I trying to achieve? How do I use this stuff to get to what I'm trying to achieve? We transfer that, we take that into science. We take that into economics, we take it into engineering, we take it into philosophy, we take it wherever we're going to go. That transfers, that's the critical skill. And right now it's almost nowhere in math classes, but math class is the best place to teach it because you have this great feedback. You get the answer right, you know you have the answer right. Can't do that in a writing class. You know, a writing class, we want to train kids to be good writers, but they don't really know when they have it right. The teacher doesn't always know when they have it right. Like it's very subjective. It's very, it's very hard. It's very individual. Whereas math, you got the answer right, you got the answer right. You know you have it right. You get that feedback very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, that, yeah, that brings up a lot of a lot of interesting ideas, and in wh where that um, that well, that that the problem solving is a skill, not a given. So it's not like people who are who are only gifted in that, and they're the ones who be, should be winnowed out. Um, I think in our system, maybe in our system, our system a little bit less so than other countries that I know about. We do a, we use education a lot more for a lot less for winnowing winnowing out, thankfully. Um, but it sounds like it still is a problem. Like we're, we're looking for objective truth uh, and high scores and everything. If you don't get the high scores today, tomorrow, and the next day, you know, let's shift you over to somewhere else where you can, you can try, try again. Is that, is that part of the problem too, or to some degree? You want to have a lot of on-ramps. Like, I think this is one of the things that actually is really strong about the American education system is that there are on-ramps later in life. Yeah. Yeah. You, so. you, yeah. Whereas a lot of countries, if you, you're not succeeding at 12, you're done and you're, you're yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the two-year college system in America that yeah. has, you know, can lets people who maybe didn't have access to resources who just got sidetracked at 16, um, get back on the on-ramps at 24 or, or whatnot. So, but I think you want those built all throughout the education system is you want a chance for a student at age 
eight to, uh, to self-identify as, hey, this is something the kid really wants to do a lot, and at 12, and at 14, and at 17. Like, you, you want to have a lot of opportunities for um, a kid to get turned on to something because you don't know when that's going to happen. So you want to have these sorts of opportunities baked into the curriculum as opposed to the way it was when I was a student and still is now. If you wanted to be exposed to these sort of interesting areas of mathematics, it had to be outside the classroom. It had to be on a math team. It had to be at a, at a summer camp or something like that. Uh, and not all schools have those and not all kids are going to encounter those. There might be, they might not know about them or there might be social obstacles. Or opt in, yeah. I, yeah. It was hard for me to get my kids to consider math camp, you know. Right. No, though they weren't bad at math, but they, you know, that, that's not usually the chosen activity. But I, yeah, yeah make, if you can make it fun, if you can make it somehow enticing, where like, can I go to math camp? It's a lot different than can I go to learn how to use an abacus for six <laughs> six weeks? Yeah, and and part of that is social. Like a big part of that is social. And for me, going into math count math counts and math competitions, it was seeing that there actually are large groups of not only kids but adults that really value this skill. You know, I didn't see, of course the teachers say that, but I'm 13, I'm not gonna listen to my teacher. And right. of course my parents tell me school is important. I'm 13, not gonna believe my parents. Um, but when I go into a room and I see all these other kids that are really excited about this activity that I actually kind of like, and they like the same books I like, and they play the game, same games I play, and then I see a whole bunch of other grownups in the room that are part, you know, maybe they're being judges in the competitions and they're excited to see that there are these 13 year olds that are excited about math. I had never seen adults be excited about kids who weren't their own, except at a sporting event. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was the only time I'd ever seen that until I went to this math competition. There were all these parents of the other kids and they were actually pretty excited to be there and seeing all these kids who were excited about math. And what I didn't realize at that time was that this is the way the world is when, when these kids get older, right? There's a whole world out there for kids who are really interested in math, really interested in science. That's going to be their professional and probably social world for the rest of their lives. They don't know that world even exists when they're 13, unless they happen to be in the right neighborhood or in the right school. And they likely have, there's a lot, a lot of prejudice. I mean, the, the classic nerd has gotten, has become a lot more sexy in the last 20 years, but certainly yeah. when I was in high school, you know, if you were big in, in STEM, you were not the most popular kid in class, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, and I suspect it's still true in middle school because middle school is just awful. Yeah. Um, but my guess is by high school and definitely by college, it's clear. Yeah. So, so let, let's talk about a little bit about the digital divide and how, what people are being excluded and how to bring bring them along. I, I, want, I want to talk about the, the girl, girls versus boy part as well, but the, in the di digital divide, is that improving at all since people have at least put a name to it and started addressing it? I, I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what comes out. It's a long-term uh, issue. It's of, not of the pandemic. For a day. Just, I mean, the pandemic, I think, highlighted it as a systemic problem in education and whether, whether the system is going to actually do anything about it rather than just talk about it, we'll see. But there were a lot of school systems that were suddenly like, okay, we've got to teach online. Oh, wait, what? 40% of our students don't have internet access at home? Yeah. Uh, now what do we do? Right. Uh, so I think it, there's, there's a greater awareness that this, is, that this is a real issue. Whether or not it's going to be solved is a, is a very different issue. So we have a separate from Art of Problem Solving. I founded a, a nonprofit called the Art of Problem Solving Initiative that runs it runs summer programs um, for students in New York City and Los Angeles uh, from under, underserved communities. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of black and Latino students in, in both areas. Uh, and so we run summer programs, then we give them support through the school year. Now, of course, this past year, everything's had to be online. So the, you know, last March or April, we make the decision, oh, we've got to do this all online. Well, teaching the kids online, that was like the fifth problem we had to solve. You know, we had to get them computers. We had to get them internet connections. We had to, in some cases, we had to get them food. Like this was, it was the set of challenges just seeing that we had to solve for executing those summer programs. And then to think school systems having to do that on a school-wide scale, on a system-wide scale. Yeah, I, I like, just sounds like a problem. <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty good problem solver. I don't know if I could have handled that problem any better than they did or than, than they didn't, but at least you'd hope that in some of these places, some people became much more aware of how really disparate um, the access is. Uh, you know, some school districts started getting computers and started getting internet for some of those students. Will we see more of that? I don't know. 
Yeah. But that would be that would be a step in a direction. But that's not cheap. Yeah, no, it's yeah. It's too, well, I, but there was there was talk about hundred dollar computer computers there about five or six years ago. I don't know whatever happened to that. But it, it, how can you expect kids to take advantage and rise to their capabilities if you you don't even give them the paper and the pencil to you know to work with? So it, obviously, it's a huge challenge. So so what uh, I. Always curious about the, the girls and STEM issue. I had a girl and a boy. Um, neither one of them they they did STEM. They did well in STEM, but neither one of them are doing STEM. I certainly tried to make uh, math and science as gender neutral as I could for my daughter, but she didn't. She didn't. You know, she didn't enjoy it the same way. Both my wife and I just love math, and we we were able to find poetry and art in math. They were just they just did not ever see that, and I I couldn't help wondering if that was a failing in the teaching in how they would bring a young girl into math or whether there are these sex differences that just exist. I've heard that th that that women use um, the frontal cortex and men use the frontal cortex and the side of the sides of the brains to process math issues. There, so there are some actual physical differences between men and women. But what, what do we do with girls? Because the worst the worst case scenario is to say, you're a girl and damn it, you're gonna learn STEM and we're gonna bring you up to equality with boys, whether you like it or not. But I mean, I wanna give everybody a but how does it, what's the best solution in your mind? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that we're gonna force you to like this thing. That never, <laughs> I mean, I think- Yeah, I know how well that works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, part of it you, you've already identified a little bit is, is, is to uh, tell a better story. And that's, I think this is not just true for, for women. I think it's true for, for more guys as well, but tell a better story. Um, but I think there's also, there is a significant social component. Uh, I think uh, the, the clearest evidence I've seen of this is there's a, an economist at MIT, Glenn Ellison. He did some research because he has, I think, four, uh, four daughters, all of whom, I think all of them turned out to be pretty mathy because the old man was an Olympiad, was a math contest type, and he probably had that culture pretty baked in right. at home. Yep. But he did this really interesting research. He went and looked where do the contest uh, winning, the women who do well in math competitions, where do they come from? Uh, and then he did the same thing with the guys. And he just wanted to look for differences in these two populations. And what he found was really interesting. The women, almost all of them tend to come from schools that have a lot of students who are uh, very advanced academically. Uh, they don't have to have a lot of girls. They just have to have a lot of students. So this, the, the math team might still be, you know, 22 guys and two girls, uh, but it's, there are 24 people that's important. Where, whereas, and almost all the girls fit that profile. Not every single one, but almost all of them fit so that profile. They were role models, even if they weren't same-sex role models. And, and a culture as well, just like a, a social acceptance yeah. of this activity. Oh, right. So it's, it's a large enough population so it doesn't look like, oh, those are the, the nerdy people over here and they got their little math thing going on, but it's enough people. Right. So it seems like, yeah, part of the school. Right. Whereas the guys, about half of them came from those communities and half of them were uh, what you might call lone wolves, yeah. like the, the only person in their school or one of three in their school that's, that's really interested in these sorts of things. Speaking as a lone wolf, uh, you know, my school, we, I, there, were, there were certainly some, but there was nobody close to as interested in it as I was. Uh, that, and, you know, I, I think that still rings true to me is that there are a lot more guys from, let's say, strange circumstances who are, uh, who are, go very deep into mathematics. It's probably may extrapolate to other areas as well. And I don't know if that's genetic or if that's cultural. The, these differences that are observed here. If it's just something that girls are more socially responsive and that's that's why this outcome happens, or if they're trained to be more socially responsive, uh, you know, who, who I don't know. And, you know, if, if I even speculate on it, I can't be president of Harvard anymore. Uh, not that I ever <laughs> want to be president of Harvard, but uh, uh, I, I think that was a very interesting result that, uh, that Glenn came up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've got to ask this because I, I face this in my own life and I know there, there was a, a performance art piece I saw years ago, I can't remember the guy's name, but the, the, the wall that happens with, uh, in, in mathematics, I was, I was always top of my class in math, blah, 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 going along, got to college, did, uh, did calculus and progressively within weeks of calculus, I mean, I think I, I did survive, I got a B or something, but within weeks, I realized that I had hit my my wall for for uh, mathematical understanding that I I could not pretend that I was going to you know go on to be a, 
a mathematician, certainly. That wasn't really my interest area either, but it was such an obvious point. I've heard that people face this at various various points of their progression in the math world, that they are going along and it's like so easy, and then it, bam, done. What, what do you know about that? Yeah, I mean, everyone hits this wall. That's the thing yeah. I know about this. And okay. Uh, the, the, the key is to is to know and learn how to climb over it. And this is why we need to introduce the wall early and oh. not, not late. So when I started art of problem solving, uh, uh, about a year in, I got a, an email from a, a classmate of mine in college. I didn't, I didn't know him in college, um, but he, he wrote an email that said something along the lines of, I got a perfect score on every math test I took in middle school and high school. And then I went to, to Princeton and I took math 103 and 104. This is the kind of entry, entry level calculus sequence, which was one of the most bewildering experiences of my <laughs> life and poisoned me on math for years. Stop studying science, stop studying yep. math. And you know, that causes me to reflect a little bit about what was the difference between his experience and mine? Because I saw this a whole lot when I went to Princeton. Yeah. Like students who came in, they were valedictorians, they got perfect scores on everything. And that first year math class, that first semester math class, whatever it was, was just a nightmare for them or their first physics class. They just were not equipped to deal with what was going on in that classroom. So my experience was I did all these math competitions and uh, my sophomore year, so I, I came from my middle school, I was in Tennessee, high school, I was in Alabama and Tennessee. Um, I, I'm sorry, middle school, I was in Tennessee and Alabama, high school, I was in Alabama. So um, my 10th grade year, I got invited to this training camp for the top 24 students on a series of math competitions. And then they would take the top six to determine the US team. And I think before the year I had gone, I don't know if anybody on the Alabama math contest circuit had ever gone to this camp. So I was very sure I was the smartest person in the world. <laughs> then I got to the camp. I got to this camp and the problems were completely different than anything I'd seen before. Uh, there were proofs. There would be three or four problems, three or four hours. I'm there for five weeks. I see, I don't know, let's call it 15, 20 of these tests. I see around 60 problems. I got exactly none correct. Oh yeah. Not a single one. So, wow, definitely not the smartest person in the world. <laughs> no question. So I, I go back home and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna learn more math like all those other kids know. Cause that's, the, that's clearly the problem. I just don't know enough stuff. I had this stack of formulas I knew. And over the next year, boy, I stack a higher. Wow. I learned a lot of formulas. I learned a lot of theorems. I was going to get back to the camp, show them what I could do. I get back to that camp and I showed them what I could do. Still couldn't do any of the problems. Oh my God. <laughs> Another wow. whole summer, 60 problems, didn't solve a single one. So the following year, I spent the next year going back through and trying to prove some of these theorems that I had memorized realized I couldn't do it um, and started learning how to prove a yeah. few of them. Like I couldn't prove all of them, but I started thinking, why are these things true? How do I put the pieces together? How do these pieces really work? I think it was the first time I was doing something that actually is mathematics, actually is problem solving. I was pattern matching before. I was doing what a computer does. My senior year, I was doing what a human does. Yeah. I was one of the Olympiad winners that year. I was an alternate for the US team. I couldn't solve all the problems. I wasn't the smartest person in the world, but I could solve some of them. I had hit a wall. It took me two years to get over it. Yeah. And this is the experience we need to give to students. Like it was great for me in a math contest because this, what are the stakes? It doesn't matter. Right. But your first year of college, you hit that wall in your first year of college, you're like, peace out. The yeah. stakes are huge. Yeah. The stakes of failure are so high. So instead of, instead of giving this wall experience uh, in the first year of college where quitting is so expensive and it's so much easier for people to quit, we bring it back to when they're young and they're tougher and the stakes are lower. Yeah. A nine-year-old, you give them a hard problem, they don't solve it. <laughs> they're nine, they're tough. They're going to come back tomorrow and they're going to, they're going to try something else again. They're going to try it again. They're, they're, not, they're not going to be like, oh, if I can't do this, it's the worst thing. And it's the worst thing. Or maybe I'm just not smart enough to do this. They don't define themselves that way anymore. Or they, 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 well, they might, some nine-year-olds might, but they, not the way they will when they're 19. This fiction of the wall, it is a fiction. You can learn how to climb over it. You've probably done it and other things. It's time to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've probably done it in things that you really enjoy. The first time you did a podcast, you probably got done it. We're like, I could do that better. <laughs> um, well, and but it's not, you know, the, the wall that people perceive, it's not like a, wow, I was, you know, like you say, it was, it was zero or, 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 or did it. So the, the problem is usually that you, uh, you, you, you feel completely like it's not something you can do. Yeah, and it's the thing is, college. The difference between college. This is another reason we want to bring these challenges earlier. In college, when you're at a at a 
you know, in a university math class, nobody gets 100. Nobody gets 95. Like an A is 70. You know, a 70 is a great result on a test, but they don't. Well, I remember my calculus class, an A was 17. I mean, that's how hard it yeah. was. <laughs> Right. And they, I mean, they tell you that, but you don't believe it, right? Because you've gone through 12 years of schooling where an A is 95 and they tell you an A is 20, you're, you're 19, right? You're like, oh, the adults are lying to me again. I know an A isn't 20. I know it's still really 90. And even if they put an A next to the 30% on your test, you're like, I only got 30%. I know the bar is up here. You're telling me it's here. I don't believe you. And I think that's, again, why we want to bring these challenges earlier, these college tests that my classmates were struggling on, they looked exactly like these math contests to me. Three or four problems, three or four hours. I didn't understand the problems the first time I read them, had to figure it out as I was going along. It took me two years to figure out how to do that, but I knew how to do it by the time I started college. My classmates didn't. And that I think is not because I was smarter than they, not because I went to a better high school than they did, um, but because I had this experience. Somebody or two years of struggling taught me how to climb over the wall. Some of them stayed with it. And by the time they got out of college, they could do things I couldn't do. But a lot of them quit. A lot of them moved into other areas thinking I just wasn't good enough to be a scientist. And they were wrong. So, so I, you know, that's a change in the, the education system because so much of math and a lot of sciences do build on concepts. And if you, you didn't grok that thing at one point you, you're, and you never grok it. For me, for me in chemistry, it was the concept of the mole. Uh, you know, the, the, that thing just devastated me. And I'm sure that one, unlike some of the things in calculus, I felt like if I had just had somebody who took me aside and said, uh, clearly you don't get the mole thing, it's holding you back. And I could have spent, you know, an hour or a week or a year, you know, maybe I would have gotten it. I would, I'd be, a, I'd be a chemist today. Like I, my father wanted to be, but, uh, but um, it stopped me. And, and, and that must happen all the time with kids who just, they don't get a concept. Therefore, math is bad. I'm not good at math. And it's, it's over with. Yeah. And the hard part there is, is the, the problems sometimes crop up much later. So when I would, um, I taught high school very briefly until I realized how hard it was. Uh, I was 22. I'm 49 now. You can imagine what I looked like when I was 22. So discipline was difficult. Uh, but when I was teaching, I would sometimes have students who were really struggling with algebra. And when I'd sit down with them and work with them very closely, I realized their problem wasn't algebra. Their problem was fractions. That the problem was actually three years earlier. And if we could go back and fix that, we'd have a fighting chance with algebra. But you know, pulling them back and saying, let's go back and talk about one half plus one third. You know, they're like, that's fifth grade. I'm like, yeah, that's where the problem is. Let's do that for a while. Uh, and I think having more mechanisms in place that would identify these things earlier um, and, and correct them. And I think the problem, the reason some of these things happen is this recipe approach that we were talking about earlier is the kids are taught this, these are the mechanical steps you go through to add these two fractions. And they, they just understand it as mechanical steps rather than understanding what the operations really mean. So that as we make the fractions a little more complicated and make it X over two plus X over three instead of one half plus one third, now they're thinking, oh, I've got another whole set of recipes to memorize. Like if you had been taught and understood how one half plus one third actually works in the first place, instead of just learning, and, uh, learning the recipe, X over two plus X over three becomes obvious because the kids understand X plus two X or one X plus two X, that gives you three X's, that's three X. They understand that. X over two plus X over three. Oh my goodness, what's that? If they understood the addition of fractions, they'd be able to come over here much more quickly. Well, it does uh, does give me hope because I think what you're talking about a lot is, 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 I mean, the theme here has been a lot more on problem solving than it has been on rote memorization, which was always my uh, my bet noir. I could, <laughs> the, the memorization problem really stops you, even if you're a good uh, good thinker. Yeah. So let's talk about your um, your your company, Art of Problem Solving, and what parts of this puzzle it addresses. I, I assume it doesn't address the, the the broad spectrum of kids. It's more I, the ones who you've identified who who are interested and have pot larger higher potential. Yeah, I mean it's it's it changes as the kids get older. So I kind of think of. Uh, training and education is there are three steps. One is discovery, uh, and the next is inspiration, and then the third is training. So first, the first step is discover, is to find those kids who are, have an inclination, have an aptitude. Um, the second is inspiration, is getting those kids to accept it and, and build an identity as, hey, this is a thing I really love to do. And then the third step there is to go really deep into, uh, deep into the subject and, and really develop those skills. These tend to happen, 
I mean, they can happen at any, any age, but they tend to happen a discovery by the end of elementary school. You can kind of start to pick out some of the kids who are really interested in this stuff. It accelerates in middle school, and that's where the inspiration and identification really starts to happen. So this is our the, the nonprofit I mentioned that does summer programs in New York and Los Angeles, and we're starting to spread around the country as well. We focus in middle school on, on this identity step of getting the kids to be like, oh, I'm a math person. Um, and then uh, in middle school and then in the high school is where the specialized training really starts to deepen. So our elementary materials, we cast a wider net, uh, partly because the kids are more tightly grouped. You know, the kids are more tightly grouped in terms of um, the, the, their history, their access that they've had to education already, and in terms of their interest and the amount they're willing to work. So you can write a curriculum that's designed for, say, the top 10% uh, in terms of interest and ability and still hit the top 50 because they're, they're close enough. By middle school and high school, you can't do that anymore. Like there's no curriculum that's going to work for your top 10% that's going to work for the middle, the middle student. Like I just don't, there are plenty of people who will say that exists. I don't believe it exists. And by high school, it's really extreme. Like by high school, the top kids are really starting to, the most interested kids are starting to really pull into a different space, just like the best basketball players need something different than, you know, the rec league players than the kid playing in PE. They're really separating. That's when you're going into the deep training mode and preparing for college and preparing beyond. Um, so our Beast Academy, that's our elementary school, is we have books. Um, our textbooks are comic books, which we do because comic books are fun for sure. But we also did it partly, we knew it was all gonna be digital and you don't wanna go digital just with worksheets. We also have books that have just worksheets in it as well. But we, we use the comic books for, for two core reasons. One is there are a lot of concepts that can be taught and appreciated and understood visually better than just through words or through you know the other mechanisms we might use and a comic book is a great mechanism to to show that world but a second is a little bit more subtle so our, our comic books at beast academy the students there are students in this world they're little monsters and they're going to school and they're in classroom settings and they are modeling the sort of the sort of activities we want our kids to do as they're learning or, or the, the students who are using the materials um, and the kids that they start to emotionally put themselves into the setting. And this is really important because you've had kids, you know, you can't lecture a third grader. It just doesn't work. You need to have a conversation. So we model these conversations in the books. The kids are, are collaborating. They're correcting each other. They're sometimes wrong. They're, they're correcting themselves. They're doing all the sorts of things that they will do in a constructive classroom or in a constructive home setting with their parents. And the kids will, again, they'll, they'll want to be one of the little monsters too. Some of them dress, dress up like little monsters for Halloween and send us pictures. It's really adorable. Um, but that is the way we can simulate a conversation through a book. And that's really powerful for, for a younger kid. And then we have an online learning system that goes with this. So we have online versions of those books. We have, oh, it's like, it's like 800 videos that I made. And you can see that I can go on and on. You want to hear me go on and on about math? Well, there you go. And then we have a, a bunch of online activities, lessons and interactives, puzzle games written by the uh, people that I mentioned earlier, um, where students can you know, play online and, and learn online. Um, moving into middle and high school, we have a series of textbooks. Now, this is where, you know, like I said, we're, we're shifting into training mode now. So we're, we're using a different medium. Uh, we're using a medium that's maybe more, more efficient and more, has more depth and more detail. Uh, as we start to build out all these textbooks. These textbooks are designed for middle and high school students who are uh, more likely than average to go into a STEM discipline. These are kids who are, you know, they're-, they're and in general, are all these resources for, for educators or for individual kids to access on the website? Either either one, either one. So we, we have schools that use some of our materials and then we have a lot of people that use them as part of homeschooling or as just part of a supplemental. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of kids who, they go to school, they do math in school because they have to, but they get their learning from us. Mm. Like that's, that's kind of the way they would conceptualize it. In middle and high school, we have an online school that we've been running for 18 years now, uh, for, for quite a while. So we started before there was Facebook, before there was Khan Academy. Um, you know, Facebook's a little bit bigger than we are, but we still want to catch up. Um, so we have an online school there where we bring together kids from all over the world who are really deeply into mathematics. And we've been training a lot of the best students in the United States for basically that whole time. Um, and then um, we also started learning centers over the last, well, we started in 2016. 
So we've got 10 learning centers around the country, and now we have a virtual version of those learning centers as well. And the learning centers span elementary through high school. So uh, they, they tend to skew a little bit younger than our first online school, um, but we now have a virtual school that teaches all our Beast Academy curriculum. And those classes are a little bit different than our regular, than our original online school. Our original online school is all text and image based. There's no video, there's no talking um, because kids can read a lot faster than they can listen. Um, they can also reread. They can read better than they can listen. So, you know, they, they miss something the first time they can go back and, oh, read one more time. Okay, now I've got it. Whereas in a classroom, if you miss hear something, oh, you might be lost, you might be done, you, you, you might be finished. Um, so it's a, it's a more efficient medium. It also allows kids to communicate at any time. They're talking all the time. You know, they're constantly sending stuff in and I, as the instructor, I'm seeing what they're sending in and I'm picking out things that I wanna share with the whole room or talking to the kids privately. Um, again, it's, 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 it sounds nuts, but it's, it's the kind of thing you have to see to really appreciate. It works really well for the kids who, older kids who are really, um, really dialed in. Uh, for the younger kids, we use a, uh, something more like this. We have a video, you know, we have a video classroom that we've built out over the last year and a half during the pandemic when all of our learning centers went online and suddenly we had to figure out how to teach nine, nine year olds in a live classroom, just like the rest of the world did. Um, we pulled it off in a week because we have some pretty amazing people in our operations and our software engineering team that put it all together and our curriculum teams. But um, so that's our, that's another one of our online schools. And like I said, we have physicals, we have physical campuses that we hope to be back in person um, this fall. So, and then uh, the obvious question is going to be how, like, how, how do you compare then to a Khan Academy, which I think has become like, you know, that's probably top of mind for a lot of, a lot of people when they think of getting online instruction. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm a big fan of Sal. He's um, uh, I actually did a, uh, had a, uh, something like this with, it was just me and Sal just kind of reminiscing about our experiences with, with online education. That was maybe three, four months ago as he was launching a new project called schoolhouse.world. Um, he defines himself and his family as an AOPS family. Like you go to his office, there's a whole wall of there's AOPS books there. They very first, uh, yeah. when he kind of really started taking off was there was a, a segment on CNN. And if you watch that closely, there's one where he's showing how he's making one of the videos. He's holding the geometry book I wrote. Oh, wow really warms my heart. So he's got good taste in math, I like to think. Um, <laughs> and I think you know, basically like Sal, Sal's material is great for the broader audience. Like it is, it is the, the student who's struggling in fifth grade and needs to, needs to go and kind of brush up on something or a kid who's starting to accelerate and starting to get excited. And there's a point, and I think he would probably describe it as the same way where once a kid is really activated and is like, oh, this is the thing it's time to hand off and come to us. So we have a lot of students in common. You know, we have a lot of students who started and, and you know, parents put them on Khan Academy and the parents saw, oh, she really likes this. She'll do this all day long and she's getting everything right. I need something more challenging for her. Then they go on the line and they start looking around and they start asking their friends and they're like, oh, you really wanna be looking at Beast Academy or you really wanna be looking at, at AOPS. So then there's a transition. Uh, and then there's a lot of our you know, our uh, alumni work at Khan Academy and some of them work here and there are a lot of okay. Khan Academy alumni that work here as well. So we have a, we have a lot of, a lot of connections. Great. All right. Well, it's been really interesting conversation about all these things. We've covered a lot, a lot of ground. Maybe we could have gotten deeper on, <laughs> on five <laughs> or six of them, but uh, I really appreciate your time because it gives a lot of perspective, I think, to, to fathers dealing with, uh, you know, what, what, uh, how, how to choose, how to help, how to, how to guide, um, it's, 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 it's so important to have some level of STEM education. And then obviously if you, when you discover your kid really has some potential or interest, uh, to, to help, help them, uh, to feed that interest. So, Excellent. um, so I guess we'll wind, wind it up. I'm Paul Banks with greatdad.com. And if you're interested in our coaching services for new and older dads, you can find me uh, more at uh, greatdad.coaching. And again, our guest is Richard Russick, who's, uh, who's the CEO of Art of Problem Solving. You can find him at artofproblemsolving.com, right? All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. See you next week. Thanks. Right.